IRAC is a paradigm or a method for writing your law school exam answers. In this video, we'll talk about what IRAC means and we'll focus on identifying the issue so we can write single issue IRACs. IRAC is one of the most commonly taught methods for writing law school essay exam answers. And it's helpful to get all the points you need to pass your exam and the bar. We'll cover some basics of IRAC today, although I expect you've already heard some of these things in law school. I want to focus on some common mistakes students make in having non-single issue paragraphs. And I'll focus on an advanced concept that I think explains the single issue concept that I call smushing. And I'll do this through a process of examples and illustrations meant to help you understand. The IRAC paradigm stands for issue, rule, application or analysis, and conclusion. Now that is issue, not issues. And this is really important because the most common mistake students can make is dumping a bunch of issues at the beginning, followed by a ton of rules, and then something that approaches analysis and a conclusion. But what you really need to do to show the professor or the bar examiner that you understand the law is to develop an IRAC for each issue. That way you can show that you've spotted the issues that are relevant you can figure out which rules pertain to those issues. You can apply the facts of this case and other cases you have learned to the rule at hand, and you can conclude on how a judge would determine on that issue. Of course, you do want to come up with an overall conclusion to whether or not, for example, in contracts, a contract is formed, but you need to get there analytically, step by step, showing that you can develop legal reasoning. One of the key features of IRAC is its single issue paragraph structure. You're going to use a different IRAC for each separate issue. The I in IRAC stands for issue. And again, that's issue, not issues. You want to deal with each issue separately to show that you can spot what issues come up in a set of facts. As a lawyer, your job is to be exposed to facts that a client brings and determine what legal issues arise from those facts. There might be many issues, but you want to deal with each one separately, at least in law school and probably on the bar exam, so you can show the examiner that you know how to perform legal reasoning. The advanced portion of this video, when we go deeper into issue, is a discussion about what constitutes a single issue and when we are going to deal with issues separately. For example, we know that the law of negligence has four elements, duty, breach, cause, and damages. So is negligence an issue, or is each of duty, breach, cause, and damages separate issues, each meriting its own IRAC? It depends on the facts, and we'll look at some examples to get a better idea about when we're going to smush the issues and when we're going to deal with them separately. Stating the rule is an important step in your legal analysis because you're going to apply the facts to the rule you state, but you need to state only the rules that pertain to the issue that you're dealing with in this IRAC paragraph. For example, if we're dealing with offers, we know that there are three rules that determine whether or not we have an offer. It has to be an objective manifestation that is not preliminary negotiations and is reasonably certain. Are we going to state all three rules or just one? That depends on how we identified the issue. Your professor should tell you whether or not in your exam you need to cite where the rule came from. But in general, it's a good idea to support your rule statement with a citation to where the law comes from, whether that's from your case, from a treatise, or from a restatement of law, depending on how your professor has presented the material and asked you to cite it. Next, we're going to apply the facts in our fact pattern to the rule. We have to read and understand the fact pattern first to know how we're going to develop the IRAC paradigm. Certain fact patterns will give rise to what I call smushed issues, where we deal with several sub-issues or all the elements in one issue and in one IRAC. Other facts are going to require us to expand our IRAC, do several IRACs for each sub-issue so that we can develop it fully in our analysis section. The analysis section is also the place where you're going to make analogies and distinctions to cases that you have read, which will make your argument more convincing. Finally, you should conclude on how a court of law would likely hold on the issue. That conclusion should flow from your analysis and should reference the key facts and the rules that came from this issue. Make sure that your conclusion is in line with the analysis that you have done 
Otherwise, you'll probably lose points because it will seem that you did not perform the analysis correctly. The conclusion is rarely the most important part of a law school essay, but you can't leave it out. So make sure you always conclude on how a court would likely hold for each issue that you bring up, and if you're dealing with sub-issues, at the end of dealing with your sub-issues, make a general conclusion as to how the overall issue would be resolved. What exactly are issues? Well, I teach contract law, and if you're watching this video, you've probably taken at least contracts one, so you've learned that there are some issues about contract formation. You know that all contracts require offer, acceptance, and consideration, but that's too big to deal with. We don't want to approach all of offers and all of acceptance and all of consideration as one IRAC. Instead, we want to break it down to the constituent parts and focus on the issues that are raised by the facts in front of us. So some sub-issues would be, for example, was an objective manifestation of an offer made by the offeror? Or did the offeree have a subjective reason to know this was mere preliminary negotiations? Or was the offer insufficiently definite so that a court would not be able to enforce its terms? Those are the type of issues that we're going to address in each IRAC because we can manage them separately and do our analysis completely. As I've mentioned a few times, schmushing is the idea that if you have multiple rules or multiple sub-rules or multiple sub-sub-rules or multiple elements or however you want to think about the constituent parts of a big rule, do you put it in one IRAC or do you separate it out? And as I'll evidence in this video, it really depends on the facts that are presented. Sometimes you're going to use one IRAC to deal with offer. Sometimes you're going to use three to deal with the various subparts of offer. Sometimes you'll use one IRAC to deal with negligence, and sometimes you'll use four to deal with the elements of duty, breach, cause, and damages. It all depends on the facts presented. So read the prompt carefully and think about how you want to organize your answer so that you can do the analysis completely. Let's talk about some rules that we can use and make sure we all have the background law necessary to understand this next section. In my Contracts 1 class, I say that we're in a restatement jurisdiction generally. And I allow the students to cite to the restatement second of contracts as a source for rules. It has three main rules about whether an offer is made. It defines offer in section 24. It contrasts offer with mere preliminary negotiations in section 26. And it mentions that all offers have to be reasonably certain in order to be offers indeed in section 33. Section 24 defines offers as the manifestation of willingness to enter into a bargain so made as to justify another person in understanding that his assent to the bargain is invited and will conclude it. Section 26 adds to this by distinguishing offers from preliminary negotiations because a manifestation of willingness to enter into a bargain is not an offer if the offeree knows or has reason to know that the offeror did not intend to conclude a bargain until the offeror has made a further manifestation of assent. And even though a manifestation of an intention is understood to be an offer, both objectively and subjectively, it cannot be accepted as to form a contract unless its terms are reasonably certain. Should we smush all of these rules into one issue so that we can deal with them in one IRAC? If we did, it would look something like this. Our issue statement would be something like, is there an offer? Because we're dealing with the whole concept of offers in one IRAC. And the rule, which we would paraphrase the restatement in our own words, would sound something like, to constitute an offer, the offer or statement must be objectively understandable by a reasonable third person as expressing willingness to enter into a bargain, subjectively understood by the offeree as intending to conclude the bargain, and reasonably definite. On the other hand, depending on the facts, we may not want to smush it together. And as you can see on your screen, we end up with a lot more content. We'd actually have three separate IRACs, one for each of these sub-rules or elements to the rule of offer. The first would be the issue of whether there was an objective manifestation of an offer. And here we would state the rule from 24. The second issue would be, was the manifestation actually just preliminary negotiations? And here we would state the rule from 26. And finally, we would have a third separate IRAC, a completely different paragraph with its own issue rule, analysis, and conclusion 
on whether the manifestation was reasonably definite, and then we would have the rule from section 33. Whether you smush the rule statement into one IRAC or whether you expand it into three really depends on what the facts presented are. Generally, you're going to try to smush it together into one IRAC where the facts are not that complicated or where the issues are not that deep so you can deal with them more quickly and focus on the issues that are important on this exam. You're probably going to be under time pressure, so don't develop every argument just for the sake of completeness. Some issues are more important than others. But when you do come across an important issue, and when the sub-issues each have arguments on both sides, you're going to want to expand that so that you have a separate IRAC for each sub-element so that you can do your analysis more thoroughly. We explored a rule that has three sub-rules, and now we're going to look at whether or not we're going to smush that or not. I use the term subrule in this case because the restatement really does set forth three rules that all pertain to offer, and we know that a general rule is that all contracts require an offer. We're going to smush together the issues of whether or not an objective manifestation was made, whether it was subjectively understood not to be preliminary negotiations, and whether it was reasonably certain if it's pretty clear that there's an offer in this case. However, if we're obviously being tested on whether there's an offer and all of these sub-elements are raised, we're going to want to make sure to deal with all of them separately. You can apply this to all of your law school classes. Just think about whether or not a rule has separate elements, and if it does, do you want to deal with each element separately, or can you deal with them all together? For example, if you're taking a torts exam, you might have an issue of negligence that's raised. Do you want to deal with negligence in just one IRAC, or would you be better off developing the argument more thoroughly by having a separate IRAC for each issue of duty, cause, breach, and damages? that prove the elements of negligence. Let's take a look at some examples. Example 1. Here's the fact pattern you're presented. Morton Salt Inc. sends a letter to the City of Chicago stating, we are prepared to deliver road quality salt to your city for $5,000 per ton. To accept this offer, please respond within five days. Take a minute and think about whether or not you would want to deal with this in a smushed IRAC with just one IRAC for all of offer, or whether you want to separate that out into three separate IRACs to determine whether there's an offer here. I would recommend smushing this IRAC. Why? Well, only one of the sub-issues in offer is really at issue here. The only thing that's really brought up in this is we don't have price and quantity. Look back at the problem for a second and see if you can understand why that was missing. The issue of whether or not there was a manifestation of Morton's willingness to enter into a bargain, that's not really a debatable issue here. Morton sent this document out. It said this is an offer, provided matter of acceptance, and nothing implies this is going to be understood as preliminary negotiations. You could invent some facts around that, but this prompt is directing you to focus on Section 33 certainty. We're lacking price and quantity terms in this purported offer. So we want to figure out a way to get to that quickly and focus on it so we can move on to other important things. So let's write our smushed IRAC issue. Is there an offer? We're going to start by dispensing with the easy stuff. We're going to write our analysis in a way that makes it easy to get through the issues that aren't really issues. Of course, you're going to write our rule first, and that's our smushed rule. Then we're going to deal with our easy non-arguments. Morton objectively manifests an offer because it wrote directly to Chicago. And by using the word offer and providing a matter of acceptance, Chicago would think Morton was ready to enter the bargain. This doesn't sound like preliminary negotiations. That's not really the issue raised by these facts. But here's where the rubber hits the road. Whether or not this was reasonably certain enough to constitute an offer. Now, I'll slow down here. I think it's helpful to outline defendant's arguments and plaintiff's arguments and then conclude as to which is better. This is a framework a lot of law students can use to get all of the points on an exam because it forces you to look at both sides of the issue. Most of the time on a law school exam, you're asked to take an objective position. Sometimes you are, in fact, asked to represent a party, and you still want to anticipate defenses. So think about what the call of the question is and ask your professor before applying this approach. But I like it because it helps me to think about all of the issues that could come up. 
So what will defendant argue? Defendant wants to argue that there was no contract. So defendant will argue that Morton did not include quantity, which is an essential term. So the offer could not be reasonably certain. Again, we're focusing on reasonable certainty. We're also going to use this section to cite to our cases that help prove this point. That's part of our analysis section. We read a case called Pavel where the trial court found that there was no offer because there was no meeting of the minds of quantity and the appellate court affirmed. We read another case called Nordine that an offer was made because quantity was specified. So we're going to make an analogy to Pavel and a distinction from Nordine to bolster defendant's argument that we do not have an offer that can be accepted because we are missing the essential term of price and quantity, and so the offer was not reasonably certain. We have some ammunition on plaintiff's side, too. Plaintiff could counter that Morton did specify the subject matter, the salt, and provided a price per ton, and it seemed to imply in good faith to provide all the salt Chicago needs this winter. And we know from Section 2306 in the UCC and Restatement Section 33, Illustration 10, that we can have a requirements contract, all Chicago needs, constitute a sufficient quantity term. But let's get real. A court will likely find for defendant because quantity is almost always a required term. And we also learn that good faith is not used to fill in terms where an offer does not exist. Courts don't create contracts where parties did not intend one. Courts use good faith to fill in terms where an offer already exists. That's not the case here. So we're going to conclude that a court will likely find for defendant there is no offer here because it lacks reasonable certainty. Let me give you another example. I Heart Tubbies messages Collector 23 on Etsy and asks, will you sell me your Teletubby bodysuit for $5,000? Collector 23 replies, because of its rarity, I would not be able to sell that bodysuit for less than $10,000. I Heart Tubbies replies, I accept your offer and have wired 10,000 cash to your account. Take a minute, think about whether you would smush this issue or expand it. Ask yourself of the three sub-elements of offer, which are raised by the facts here and which are easy to dispense with quickly. My advice here, don't smush it. All three issues and offer are implicated here. You should deal with each separately so you can develop your argument fully. Let's take a look at how to do it. Let's begin with our first IRAC on whether or not there was an objective manifestation of willingness to be bound. We're going to state our rule statement a little more fully here because we're getting into it more deeply and say something to the effect of, to constitute an offer, the offeror's statement must be objectively understandable by a reasonable third person as expressing willingness to enter into a bargain. You can also use the words directly from the restatement, but I think it's helpful to put it in your own words because then you show you really understood the rule. The defendant will argue, here the defendant saying there's no contract, that this was not a manifestation of willingness to be bound because Collector 23 replied in the subjunctive mood, hypothetically, it would not be possible unless, and doesn't specify who is going to be the buyer or that really any willingness to sell. You couldn't read that statement objectively and say that that was definitely a manifestation of willingness to enter into a bargain. Plaintiff might counter that you need to read Collector 23's statement in context. And when I Heart Tubbies said that I will buy it for $5,000, the reply, I might sell it for $10,000, should be understood as an offer. But we can actually conclude that a court will probably find that this was not an objective manifesta manifestation of intent to be bound. We shouldn't stop there, though. We should go through the entire analysis to make sure we got all the points in the exam. You might have been mistaken about how you concluded on the first IRAC, so don't just end there. Instead, move on and ask, well, was this preliminary negotiations? Remember that the initial communication had no context. I Love Tubbies made a statement out of the blue. Collector 23's reply did not suggest that Collector 23 was not negotiating with somebody else, for example. This is a person who was selling something on Etsy, so many people might have been interested in buying it for various prices. There was nothing here to suggest that the offer was concluded. In fact, the subjunctive mood again comes across as showing that this is feeling out whether or not I Love Tubbies wants to spend the kind of money 
that Collector 23 wants to receive for this item. So again, the court will likely conclude that this was mere preliminary negotiations. We're still not done. We have one more sub-rule or element to address before we can conclude on whether or not there was an offer. I know the weight of the evidence is really in favor of defendant here, but we should always go through the complete analysis that we've started to make sure we answer the question. It turns out that under reasonable certainty under 33, defendant doesn't have a very good argument because we do have price and quantity terms. Defendant might argue something like that there was no specified manner of acceptance, although promising to pay would probably be a manner of acceptance. And defendant might also argue there were some terms that were not defined, such as the cost of shipping and the delivery date. But plaintiff can reply to that and say that those are not essential terms and the deal was reasonably certain. Purchase the Teletubby suit for $10,000 that's subject matter, that's quantity, that's price, that's enough for reasonable certainty to a bargain. So on the matter of reasonable certainty, a court will likely conclude with plaintiff that there was enough reasonable certainty for determining breach and therefore this could have been an offer. Now that we've done our three separate IRACs for our three separate sub-issues, let's bring it all together and conclude on the general principle of whether or not there was an offer. There was probably not an offer that Collector 23 made and that I Love Tubbies can accept because one, Collector 23 made a statement in a subjunctive mood, hypothetically speaking. So objectively, a third person hearing that would not interpret that to be an offer, not reasonably. And this could easily have been preliminary negotiations, the way that Collector 23 was feeling out I Love Tubbies for determining how much I Love Tubbies would be willing to pay. We also don't know if Collector 23 was negotiating with other parties or otherwise prepared to make an offer and did not intend to be bound by the statements made. However, we might also add that I Love Tubby's purported acceptance was probably an offer because at that point we had price, quantity, and subject matter. Under Section 33, we have reasonable certainty. Plus, I Love Tubby's is clearly manifesting an intention to be bound and as a buyer is not bargaining with anybody else but is stating, I'm ready to buy that Teletubby suit. In conclusion, you should use single issue IRACs unless your professor has told you otherwise. It's a paradigm that is generally recognized by bar examiners and law professors as an effective way to communicate legal analysis. It begins by stating an issue, and this was about what an issue is. An issue could be something very narrow, and you want to use a narrow issue when you have to go deep into the facts to analyze it properly. You can also have a broad issue. You can smush the sub-elements together into one IRAC when there's not a lot of there there. It really takes judgment and practice, so I encourage you to practice taking these essay exams by writing them out. Test yourself and challenge your friends. Share your exam answers, your practice exams that is, and see what you think of how everyone wrote them out. Use your judgment to see what kind of analysis works best for what kind of facts. It just takes practice to figure out when you smush the IRAC and when you don't. But make sure you write in a logical, analytical fashion because you're being tested on your ability to process legal information. It's not so much about getting the conclusion right. It's about having deep analysis that shows an ability to understand and apply rules, relate them to facts and cases that you learn, make analogies and distinctions. IRAC is a great tool to do that. If you use it properly, you'll go through the analysis in a thorough manner and you won't go too deep if you smush issues that are not that relevant and you expand ones that are really important. While there are other methods that you can apply and you should do whatever your professor requires of you on the exam, this tried and true method is recognized by lawyers, law professors, and bar examiners across the country. Sometimes it's easier not to reinvent the wheel. You've got enough to worry about in law school. And it's probably a good strategy to give the judge what she or he wants. I hope this video helps you on your law school exams. Good luck!